get here despite the, uh, the troubles with the trains. So, <clears throat> let's get going. So, um, my name's Shirley Condon, for those people who don't know me. Um, I'm the deputy chair of this committee, and I'm standing in for Councillor Lewis today because he's had a, a close family bereavement and he hasn't been able to be here today. So, um, Michelle has briefed me, so please bear with me if I do make any, um, you know, frequent references to Michelle to keep me right. So let's start off with apologies uh, for absence, and Jeanette, you are going to I will, uh, advise us. Apologies are received from, oh, sorry. Apologies received from Councillor Sylvia Dacre, Councillor Jessica Leddox, um, Phil Lodgman, Colin Booth, and Phil Adams. Thank you. So those people that um, haven't sent apologies, but aren't here, you will note those on the minutes. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is for me to formally um, welcome Martin Hathaway to the meeting. Martin, welcome. Martin's the uh, Managing Director of the Mid-Yorkshire Chamber and has confirmed that he will be the ELSIP representative on the committee. So thank you, Martin. Do you, do you know everybody? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty yeah. much, yeah. But we've got our names there, so we make sure that we'll uh, introduce ourselves if you don't know people on the oh, way through. Right. So this meeting is being live streamed, which is why we've got to see, sit in the allocated uh, spaces. So next I'm going to ask if there's any declaration of disclosable uh, pecuniary interests that anybody has. No? Okay. If at any point that you feel there is, can you please uh, note as the meeting progresses? I think it's probably worth saying that some of the items on this agenda, particularly the A, B, um, what we're doing, the A, B rate means a number of people representing um, providers and local authorities probably do have a, um, might, might want to make a declarative declaration of interest for that item. Okay, thank you, Phil. And that takes me to the next point, which is some information that is exempt, um, which relates to Appendix 2 of Agenda Item 6 because it does include information regarding the AEB that Phil's just referred to, and we aren't obviously allowed to, to publish this ahead of it being published by the Department of Education. So if anybody's got any comments on that item, if you could leave it till the uh, end of the meeting when we'll finish live streaming. Thank you. Is that okay, Michelle? Yeah. Um, and the final item on the FE capital funding will be held in private for everybody's information. So I'm now going to move on to the minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of October 2022 and I'm going to ask committee members if they could firm, confirm these as an accurate record. I'm not going to go through them page by page, people have had them in advance. So if you could just indicate if you're content to approve these. Nav, yes, yes I can see nods. Thank you, thank you Milton. So we can approve those uh, minutes, thank you. Next item says, uh, is chair's update? Well, as I'm not normally the chair of this meeting, I'm going to keep this fairly brief. I think most people would have been waiting with bated breath for the Prime Minister's uh, announcement uh, in his first speech of 2023 um, to see if there was anything in relation to skills and employability that would be relevant to us. The one thing that we will need to consider going forward is the Prime Minister's ambition for all young people to study some form of mathematics till the age of 18, which uh, we will need to give some consideration to and what that impact might be and how it will look. I, I have no idea yet, Michelle. Do you want to add anything to that? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone's... Um, was a, a, yeah, it wasn't news that we were necessarily expecting, um, but a lot of the programmes that we're delivering, particularly the um, multiply and some of the supporting schools would potentially support, um, would, would enable us to support this ambition. Um, but it's something, it's something that, we'll, that this committee will be really interested in how we, um, how we implement government policy in that, in that space. Okay, thank you. Now, also, most of you will be aware we're coming up to the spring budget submissions again, and the combined authority are uh, giving this some serious consideration, as you'd expect. 
and we'll be asking for full devolution of all adult uh, employment skills and careers funding so that we can really keep it at a local context and make sure that we focus on the right skills needed for good quality work and greater devolution for employment services. That will be the key part of the combined authorities' budget submission. Um, and I'm sure that everybody will have been seriously disappointed um, at the lack of uh, support for levelling up from the levelling up funds from our region. Um, it was really, really disappointing. Um, the combined authority has received £41 million in funding to develop the bus network, which is obviously very welcome, but none of the other bids were unfortunately successful, which is uh, quite concerning and something that we should be, I think, doubling down on and thinking about um, you know, from the private sector and the combined authority in terms of what next steps might be taken. Um, that's all I really wanted to comment on as a means of um, opening the meeting, unless, Michelle or Phil, you want to add anything? No. Okay, thank you. So let's move on to the next item, which is item five, the evidence report. And Peter Glover will be presenting the latest position on the state of the region's monitoring indicators. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, so to provide context for the meeting, we'll, we'll be... I'll be providing the regular update on the relevant indicators, and it comes in two parts. So we've got the state of the region indicators, and more timely labour market indicators as a supplement to that. So state of the region uses a basket of high-level strategic indicators to track the economic progress of West Yorkshire. We have eight indicators that are directly relevant to employment and skills. Um, and the agreed approach is that we report by exception. So as fresh data becomes available, we report it to the committee. So we have two indicators that have been updated uh, in recently that we can update on. So the first one is jobs paying below real living wage, and the second one is apprenticeship take-up figures. So I have some slides which I'm hoping are going to appear. Yeah. Um, in terms of the other indicators, I'm not going to report on those today. Um, but if anyone has any questions on them arising from the pack, then, then please come back to me. The other thing to mention is that the full state of the region, in, uh, full state of the region report was published just before Christmas and is available on the West Yorkshire Combined Authority website. Within that, we've got um, a, an interactive dashboard and also an equality, diversity and inclusion report, uh, which you may find of interest. But in, in terms of the uh, state of the region indicators I'm going to cover today, First of all, real living wage. <clears throat> so obviously we want to enable good jobs in West Yorkshire and pay is a central indicator of job quality. Um, and this indicates particularly relevant because it relates to the proportion of people who have a decent standard of living through employment. The Living Wage Foundation's real living wage is independently calculated based on what people need to earn to get by and to meet everyday needs. And at the point at which this data was collected, the real living wage outside London was £9.90. Um, so that was, 20, that was April 2022. Uh, what we can see from the data is that in 2022, all parts of West Yorkshire saw a fall in the proportion of jobs that pay below the real living wage. So that's a good thing. But the key exception was Leeds, where, which saw an increase of 7 percentage points uh, on the proportion that were paid below the real living wage. Now, we've investigated this further with uh, Office for National Statistics, and they indicate that that change is within the bounds of sort of um, confidence intervals. So it could, it could be a data issue. It could be a sample error issue. But the effect of that is that the, the overall proportion of, for West Yorkshire increases from 18% to 19%. Uh, so that's two, around 202,000 jobs paying below the real living wage in West Yorkshire. That's in very stark contrast to the national average and to comparator areas, which have all seen substantial falls. Um, the sort of falls that you're seeing in the uh, local authorities in West Yorkshire, except for Leeds. Um, so to set it into further context, um, the current cost of living crisis is likely to offset, offset most of, much of the progress that we've seen in, in most parts of West Yorkshire and across the, uh, across the UK. So the real living wage threshold has already been raised by a pound an hour to £10.90 in the autumn in recognition of the impact of inflation. 
and the Real Living Wage Foundation project that in 2023, the proportion, the national proportion below the Real Living Wage will go up to around 20%. So that will also have a knock-on effect in terms of West Yorkshire. So that's a position on the Real Living Wage. And then the second indicator is around apprenticeship take-up. So the key message, the key message here is that, um, and so we're basing this on Department for Education uh, statistics that were published at the end of November um, and cover the 21-22 academic year. Uh, and the key message, as I say, is there was growth across the board in terms of apprenticeship starts in West Yorkshire. And the, show, the chart shows you the picture by level and by age band. But even though start, total starts grew by 9%, the, the, level, the level still remains a long way below pre-pandemic in 2018-19. So as you can see, 16% below. For under-19 apprenticeships, it's 22% below pre-pandemic. For intermediates, it's 39% below. Um, a key exception to that pattern is higher apprenticeships, which are 20%, 28% above pre-pandemic level. Um, it's not actually presented on the chart, but the areas where we've seen the fastest growth in terms of subject area in 21-22 were engineering, construction, and ICT. So that's a, a quick overview of apprenticeship starts position. Yeah. Um, just, just one quick thing about apprenticeships. Um, you'll notice that the number of intermediate apprenticeships, that's level two, has gone down quite significantly. Um, that's not only because of the economic situation, it's also because a lot of the level two qualifications were pulled. Um, so, for example, level two business admin, which is a very popular apprenticeship, um, is no longer available. So if you want to become a business admin apprenticeship, you need to go in fully tooled up at level two so you can start a level three qualification. Um, personally, I think this is a real kick in the teeth for those people who haven't got full qualification set at level two. Um, and I think we're stopping people from, not we, I think the, the country is stopping people at lower levels of attainment from getting into apprenticeships. Um, the level two was withdrawn by the minister of the time. We're about six ministers on now, so <laughs> things might have changed. Um, I think it would be a good thing for us to have it in our argument toolkit that we would like to see reintroduction of qualifications like the business to business admin apprenticeship level two as it's a good stepping stone for people and we are worried about the neat numbers elsewhere on the slides um, and I think it's a really quick way of addressing those numbers. Thank you Nav. I think anybody in agreement if we note that and take that as an action? Yeah definitely. Agree with that. Yeah we've lost uh, one of the engineering qualifications of the level two has, uh, has gone. Yeah, which is a great pity because it was yeah very much a call to uh, what we were doing. I've got um, IFATE at our conference on Wednesday, which I believe Lindsay is also at. So if it is something that West Yorkshire feel is something we want to argue against, then we've got IFATE and the Department for Education up in Leeds on Wednesday that we can table that. But there is a trailblazer group looking at reintroducing the Level 2 back at the moment, so watch the space on, on that one. But... I'll raise it on Wednesday as well. Yeah. Okay, so, so I think in summary we're saying that any retrograde steps that were taken to reduce the opportunities for apprenticeships at level two, we want to champion for the uh, reintroduction of those. Thank you. Do you want to come? Okay, so I, I'm just moving on to the second bit of the presentation. Uh, so this looks at the more timely indicators to give a more a fully up-to-date picture of the labour market situation. And since the papers are actually published, new data has become available to some of the indicators. And I'll touch on that as I, uh, as I go through the key points. So as we usually do, just a bit around national context, this is really important because we get ex an extra level of detail with the national data. And it points towards issues that are almost certainly important at West Yorkshire level as well. Um, I think I know the overall assessment probably is that the cost of living crisis is not have, has not had a huge impact on the labour, mar labour market so far. Um, but some observers believe that we're now at a turning point. Um, uh, and the, indeed, there are some signs of slight worsening against some of the indicators. Um, I think also the labour market is still tight, uh, but this may be, the, there are signs that this may be changing. 
Um, the number of, for example, the number of people who are unemployed is still close to record levels, uh, record lows, but it did increase in the three months to October and then in the three months to November, uh, which was based on the data released after these papers were published. What we're seeing is a flow into short-term unemployment, particularly among young people, uh, although long-term unemployment is actually falling. So it's quite a complex picture. We're seeing a slight uptick in redundancy numbers now, uh, but they're still below what we saw pre-pandemic, so to set that into context. Uh, vacancy levels are falling now. I think they've fallen for six months, six consecutive months now, but it's still very high in historic terms. Um, I think we're in a situation now where employers are citing economic pressures as a factor in, uh, in holding back on recruitment. Uh, and that vacancy situation is still powering uh, strong pay growth, at least in nominal terms. So year-on-year -year growth in pay is about 6%, 7% for the private sector, which is very high in historic terms, but not enough to actually give real terms pay increases because of the impact of uh, inflation. Turning to economic activity, Recently, we've seen modest redu reductions in activity, but it's still a major issue. Um, the early retirement effect that we're seeing during the pandemic, that, is, that has eased now, and inactivity now is really a function of long-term sickness and also quite high student numbers. Uh, so some of it, I, I guess primarily it's about people entering the labour market now rather than people leaving that is driving that. Uh, just turning to some of the local data that we have at West Yorkshire level, this first chart is around the level of pay, uh, the number of payrolled employees in West Yorkshire. So it, it's a very timely indicator of what's happening with employment based on the HMRC's ad admin systems. And it shows that that count of payrolled employees is still growing quite steadily in West Yorkshire, reflecting the national picture. It doesn't include self-employment, which has been much more subject to negative the negative impacts of the pandemic and has seen a bit of a faltering recovery since then. Um, turning to sort of claimant unemployment um, in West Yorkshire, uh, the number of people claiming um, benefits because they're out of work is still above its pre-pandemic level uh, and it's now showing early signs of increasing, reflecting what I said about the official uh, figures at national level. Um, and we also have figures for December now as, as well as for November, and it shows that, that it kind of confirms that slight upward trend that we're seeing. Um, if we break that down by age, we, we've seen a slight upward trend in uh, unemployment amongst young people throughout the summer, and that is now spreading to, that's now spread to the other broad age groups. So there's been an increase in unemployment across those broad age bands in the last couple of months. So we're seeing we're seeing a sort of um, widespread impact in the labour market, but still the increases are still very modest, but to set into context, we're still well above pre-pandemic claimant unemployment levels. Um, and if we look at the local authority picture, it's, um, it's a fairly consistent picture across all five uh, West Yorkshire local authorities, with all of them seeing an increase in the unemployment count uh, in recent months. Turning now to sort of labour demand situation, um, get an insight into vacancy trends at local level uh, based on analysis of online job postings and the latest data that we've presented here for the period up to December of last year shows that strong recruitment demand continues. Um, so, you know, it, in fact, there's no, there's no clear sign of decline unlike the national uh, official vacancy figures. So the monthly count of online job postings in West Yorkshire, you can see the figures are, figures are quite volatile, but there were nearly 34,000 unique job postings recorded in December 2022. That's an increase of 16% on the previous month and 43% higher than December 2021 and, and well above the pandem pre-pandemic levels, as you can see. And if we look at the sort of trend at local authority level, there are two, there are two aspects to it. So uh, there's been a moderation in demand, in recruitment demand in Leeds during 2022. But for the other local authorities, um, an upward trend, underlying upward trend. So the count of job postings in Leeds was 19% lower in December uh, than in January. And you can see that there is evidence of a downward trend 
across the months that we presented there. But the rate of growth ranged from 28% in Calderdale to 72% in Wakefield, 69% in Bradford across 2022 for the, for the other local authorities. So there's a bit of a, a mixed picture there which relates to a range of factors, including the sort of structure of employment in, in Leeds. Um, and then turning to the last uh, slide that I have that looks at the occupational breakdown of vacancies or online job postings, I think we can say a lot of the data are volatile. There isn't a decisive downward trend in vacancies in any of these occupational areas, which are the biggest occup occupational areas that we can measure. Um, and in fact, there was a, all the top occupational groups saw growth in online job postings during December, except for hospitality, food and tourism, which had a flat position in this December. So a big growth for information technology during the month, uh, although some fluctuations in, in previous months, and also for finance, education and training, and healthcare. So the overall position is that we are seeing some signs of increased uh, unemployment, but on the demand side, um, demand is holding up uh, for the time being. So that, that sort of concludes my input. Thank you, Peter. So this, this, this um, set of, uh, I guess, information on the slides is meant to form a context for people to engage in debate and discussion. I don't know whether anybody's got any particular comments bef before we do move on on any of, any of this. Martin? Yeah, um, we've uh, just completed our last quarterly economic survey and um, we're seeing that, that there's been a bit of a polarisation in businesses that are training their staff. So people are, are more likely to invest if they're investing in, in, in staff and in training. However, there's a lot just stopped investing at all um, because of the, the jobs market. They're worried about training staff that then just move for more money. Um, and we're also seeing uh, a lot of young people not undertaking formal, going into formal qualifications on the basis they can, they can now earn and go and work in a warehouse uh, and earn money. And there's, uh, there's a lot of pressure on those to go and do that rather than so that they can you know, peer pressure and, and family pressure them to, to earn more money rather than start apprenticeships and we're seeing a lot of apprenticeships at, at the lower level there's a lot of people wanting to pay the bare minimum so four and a half thousand pound um, and there's an awful lot of those because they can't afford to pay uh, the salaries is the way they look at it and I'm, I'm just worried that we're driving it down or having this two-tier system I mean I mean I guess what came to my mind is um this information is really important, isn't it, to help us to debate and discuss and reflect on whether the interventions we're putting in place are the right ones and how does that help us to on, you know, monitor ongoing progress. But it did make me think when I was this, read the slides previously is um, if there's something about, well, and, and, and so what, you know, so, so, so some sort of um, summary. So when we look at this all together and the trends, What's it generally telling us about the priorities and the progress that we're making, and how do we feel about that progress? That I don't know whether Peter or Michelle or Phil could think about how they might help us with that. I mean, I've, I've often I've often reflected on this point. So um, across all the committees, really. So we have separate reports because of different parts of the organisation. So it's about our organisation rather than the committee. So I think maybe there's there's a potential to bring together. Peter's report with the other reports we've got on this committee, one of which is looking at performance against our existing programmes and the other one is about pipeline of future development. So there's three separate reports of which we're having a bit of a hiatus between this item and those because we've got the other education budget next. We could probably, um, I'll pick up with Alan who is Peter's, Peter's director, but I think we could do more to bring those reports together to tell a kind of coherent story. Um, of how it all fits and pieces well, together across those across those three areas. So you've kind of got that circle of this is what the evidence tell it, is telling you, this is what our delivery is doing at the moment, and um, this is what we're going to be doing next, yeah. all together as one conversation. Yeah. And, and there's probably some of the areas that when you look at that slide there, community and social services, and then you link what you said about the national living wage, the, 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 the real living wage, and in some of those services there, community and social services will be some of those areas that they just cannot, uh, whatever they do, um, you know, work work to the to the real living wage. And it's some of these sort of 
real challenging areas that we uh, are sort of finding it very difficult to find solutions to, to bring to bear. Peter? Thanks, Shirley. Um, Peter, on the slide around employment rate by group, what's quite noticeable is the when it comes to ethnic minority, there's a fairly significant gap between West Yorkshire and England. Is that principally down to the fact that the ethnic minority population in West Yorkshire tends to be older than overall England's um, ethnic minority population? I'm thinking about younger population in cities like London. So I think, I think the main factor there is that the, the Pakistani um, ethnic group is strongly represented in, um, in West Yorkshire and employment rates for that group are lower than, than, than most of the other groups and that's particularly amongst females. So I think that is the main structural factor. Okay, any other comments? No, so we've got a, an action to see if we can bring some yeah. of this information yeah. together in a more meaningful way. But as usual, Peter, a very good set of uh, slides. Thank you. So we move on now to item six, which is the adult education budget. Um, who is this? Lindsay Daniels. Yeah. Yes. Can I declare an interest in this item and also item 10, please? Noted. Lindsay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the paper on the adult education budget covers three main topics. We've um, got a bit of a summary and some highlights from the end of year report. A little bit of an update on um, the year two performance, including the appendix, which is exempt, but we can cover any data towards end of the meeting in private if necessary. And then an item on the AEB rates, which we brought back from last meeting as well. So in terms of the, the first part, the end of year report, we're seeing some really positive highlights from that in terms of the progress of prioritising funding towards West Yorkshire's key priorities, particularly in terms of disadvantaged residents. So we can see that the proportion of learners from the most acutely deprived neighbourhoods has increased. We can see that West Yorkshire's learner profile is more diverse than in previous years before devolution and also more diverse than the national picture. We can see that there were 2,000 more people uh, than the previous year who were on a low wage that managed to access AEB. So hopefully that's one of the flexibilities that this committee uh, was key in introducing has made some impact in the, in the first year. We can see that more of the funding was spent on residents with no or low skills. And we can also see that the proportion of learners who were out of work that was supported by the fund increased as well. So again, a, a real sort of hopefully positive news in terms of how we're prioritising how the fund is spent in West Yorkshire. Uh, in term, it, it, we can also see a stronger focus on some of our key sectors, for example, digital skills. Uh, the number of enrolments on digital courses grew by 60%. And this was before um, we made the change to the digital entitlement. So we're hoping to see you know, further progress on that agenda come through in year two. So um, in terms of the full end of year report, uh, we were, were hoping to publish that in spring. Uh, this certainly should help us to um, celebrate the impact that we've made, but also it is kind of focusing our attention on some areas for improvement that we think we want to be uh, working with this committee and with the stakeholders as we as we continue on that journey of devolution. The plan is to hold a workshop for committee members so that we can really delve into the data. I think as you're all familiar, there's there's plenty of data and complexity with adult education budgets, so we really want to spend some, some good time with the committee uh, in presenting some of the findings um, so that you can you know help to help us to champion the positive things and also to challenge as well. So in terms of year two. Um, we are seeing a really, we've seen a really strong start to year two um, from most providers who are, who are ahead of their profile. More than half of the providers were eligible for growth at the four month measured period. Um, and as you've seen outlined in the paper, we've been more specific about the kind of growth that we want to see from providers and the places that we're investing our funding. Enrollments are higher than this time last year, so we're suggesting a slight um, increase uh, in, in resident confidence um, and the learner participation that we're seeing that you know, we know was dampened through the pandemic. Uh, it covers in the paper that obviously we have been notified that traineeships is going to be de-ring fenced. 
uh, for 23-24 and that that funding will return to the adult education budget pot. So we are awaiting the allocation confirmation from DfE, but we're really keen to understand the gaps in the offer for 19 to 24 year olds and particularly uh, for pre-apprenticeship provision. Um, so I know that's one of the, the asks of the committee this morning to, to have that discussion. Um, the delegated programme of free courses for jobs does remain challenging. Um, <laughs> very well discussed last year in terms of those, those level three programmes. But the good news is we are already on track to exceed the funding that was used in 21-22. So although it remains a challenge, we are seeing kind of the positive upshoots of a lot of the work from providers um, and I suppose that fund bedding in. And on to the AEB rate, uh, which is the main content of the paper. So at the last combined, uh, at the last committee meeting, um, it was asked for the combined authority to consider the options available in terms of a rate increase in West Yorkshire, given the, the discussions that were held last, last meeting and um, the case that was presented. So to be clear, the rationale for a, a, an increased rate to AEB is that the AEB funding rate's not increased for 10 years and the budget overall has fallen, so there's a call for us to tackle that disinvestment. Um, and that the current economic situation is dramatically increasing operating costs. So both of these factors are significantly impacting on quality of learning that providers are able to put on for our residents. The paper outlines a range of considerations that we've taken into account when we're considering the different options. That includes the implications of AEB as a finite pot and how we might mitigate the impact of provision in year, how we prioritise funds towards West Yorkshire's key economic needs. Um, it considers the fact that we need to invest in a quality experience for our residents and to an extent um, tackle some of the cost cutting measures alongside this. And we've also considered some of the other MCA's actions in this space. So the recommendation um, that's been put forward in the paper is to provide a rate increase of 10% and apply that retrospectively to all enrolments at level two and below for the 22-23 academic year. So that's uh, applying retrospectively from the 1st of August 2022. That as part of, that alongside the rate increase, we will also look to provide an allocation increase to all providers who are performing um, and the aim of that is to reduce the impact on any recruitment plans, particularly in the spring period where we might see the rate increase could potentially um, impact on, on provision that's been planned. That as part, although we're going to take these actions locally, we will continue to lobby nationally for an increase in devolved adult skills funding. And I know certainly um, our, our conversations with stakeholders and providers has, has really echoed that the, the national lobbying should really cover the whole of the adult skills, uh, not just AEB itself, uh, and sort of seeing the picture as a whole. Um, and then the final point is to strengthen the AEB funding rules to address some of the cost-cutting tactics that we've seen employed by some, some providers. But really the point is to ensure that the rate increases aligned to an improved impact for learners, including wraparound support and the achievement rate increases that we want to see for West Yorkshire. I'll pause now for comment. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. So at its last committee, this the last meeting of this committee, we did ask the officers to go away and explore options, and this is what's presented uh, to you today for consideration. Uh, it's addressing the shortfall or the lack of increase in funding for 10 years and trying to think about that alongside how quality can be, uh, be maintained. Um, and address some of the challenges that providers are facing. So, any any questions for Lindsay? Um, Linda, um, just a couple of things. Yeah. So on the um, uh, on the recommendation where it says um, performing, yeah, what what does the um, provider mean? Increase to all providers who are performing. What does that mean? What? How does performing get classified? So we have Tim, a performing part. Tim, I couldn't, yeah. didn't just catch your question, Tim. Did you say performing? Yes. What, what, oh, sorry. On which part of the recommendation? On um, uh, 
236B, first, uh, okay. first sentence. Or oh, provide us who are performing. Yeah, yeah it was just okay. understanding what... Um, that's fine. So, we, so we have a performance management framework published as part of the AEB rules. Um, so performing is defined as being at 95% of your profile. Um, so we, we have that kind of listed within that framework. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, uh, where, where you're describing quality of learning, yeah, um, reducing Cusselby's you know, impact, is that, uh, is that number of courses um, being reduced? Then? Is it the fact that there's less courses? can be offered by the providers, yeah? or is it uh, providing less? Uh, yeah. So I, I think we've, we've tried, I think there's, there's a few things in terms of sort of seeing the quality impact on learners. If we're talking about the existing system, um, as is mentioned in the paper, AEB is now really targeting a different dem demographic to, to perhaps where it was maybe to, to well, our providers may want to comment maybe last year, but equally sort of two, three years ago, certainly 10 years ago, um, you know, the, the kind of learners that we're trying to reach through this fund are much further from the labour market. Um, so I suppose the, the impact in the consistent disinvestment of the fund on quality is that the learners who need to be supported by this fund need more, more wraparound support, okay. more support in the classroom potentially, um, and that's what we're trying to address okay. um, with the rate. Understood. Thank you. Just, I guess, to, to support that a little, but um, quality doesn't necessarily mean we're not delivering a quality service now, because I think it is quality service now, but it's, you know, the rates haven't been increased for 10 years, but everything else has, so the purchasing of resources, um, you know, salaries for tutors, the fact that we should, we're struggling, you know, there's a recruitment crisis in FE at the moment, so we're struggling to recruit. We can't bring people out of industry to, to come and teach, you know, the, the, the dis most disadvantaged or those that are not disadvantaged. But also, you know, lots of adult education budget is delivered in the community. So hiring of venues and paying of costs, that's all increased. But the base rate hasn't. So it's not necessarily the quality of the teaching that it would support. It's the quality of the, um, of the implementing a, 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 a better kind of adult ed budget locally. I don't want the quality to, 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 the, to be seen as the quality of the teaching and the learning and the experience, because I don't think it's necessarily that. It's all of the things that go into that that's rising, whereas the base rate has stayed the same. And it will help with things like resources, teaching cap teachers' caseloads, the well-being of our own FE staff, so we don't feel like we're losing them out of our, out of our sector that, that will help. Just wanted to quantify, quantify that point because the quality is quite good. Um, as an Austin inspector, I also see that the quality is quite good. Um, just one other bit I wanted to mention: some of my providers. Um, so I represent all of the local kind of independent training providers. Um, have said that this will mean that they spend their allocations quicker if the rates go up. So I guess my question is around how we do issue growth. Um, I guess more timely, or um, if. You've talked about the, the, the planning around spring and how we can provide those assurances if the rate does go up, that it doesn't just mean that those that spend their allocation quicker because the rates improved, that increased, sorry, they're not going to get any opportunity for growth. So obviously, I'm speaking on the procured provider side, not the grant funded side. Um, so I guess we would want those assurances as well, that also the, the way that growth is issued and the providers aren't just going to be stuck out of money from May onwards. Yeah, we're already doing quite a bit of modelling about where providers are and, you know, I suppose where they are currently, uh, what a 10% increase to the rate would mean to their current activity and how that would affect the performance measures. So, you know, part of this, as, as it says in point B of the recommendation, is to um, use some of the responsiveness funding that we do have available um, to be able to support those providers and really identify those which are going to come up against a barrier and, you know, and make sure that the courses can continue to be open. The key thing, I suppose, for, for all of us is that residents who are motivated to learn and to access the adult education budget that want to come forward and undertake a programme are still able to access what they want to do in that time period. Okay, thank you for that, Lindsay. Any other questions now? Um, well, not so much questions, just a statement, really. Um, uh, and I suppose I also declare an 
interest in the, uh, representing the colleges um, as well as other training providers, uh, just fully supportive of the, that option and, and it's a real fillip. It's, it's not going to solve all the problems in the world. Um, we've only had a 2.2% raise to 16 to 18 numbers, which funding, which is a far bigger proportion of income. Um, but just fully supportive of the proposition. But what, what, one other thing that may have been uh, skipped over was about traineeships. I'm on traineeships funding going into the main AB thing. And, and I don't say this in support or against traineeships. I'm sure some people had a good outcome from doing a traineeship. But in my head, it's a perfect example of one department coming up with a stupid idea and pushing it forward to the nth degree and getting minor returns on it. Um, and I think there's a strong lesson in that for us as a devolved authority in that we may have more control over the funds, but we've got to be careful how we use them. And just coming up with pet projects isn't going to work. You can do it in consultation with providers and on research is how you come up with a new programme. Traineeships, an awful lot of money went into traineeships that came out of the adult education budget, didn't deliver as it was intended to. Um, and those cuts to AEB over the last 10 years, in part, were because of the uh, investment in traineeships. So I don't think there's a solemn message for us all in there, um, but fully supportive of the option. Thank you. So I can't see anybody else who wants to ask a question or a comment. Oh, there is. Sorry. One more, thank you. Um, just one question on the uh, on, uh, two twenty-seven, in terms of the, um, uh, the in terms of that improved data collection and reporting. Uh, looking at um, uh, looking at outcomes and destinations, uh, did you, do you have an idea of when we'd start to see that flowing through? Um, so we, some of the data challenges we have, particularly. Um, focus on community learning actually which we are undertaking a review um, so we again will should be publishing that towards the end of spring and looking at how we can improve data capture it's an ongoing discussion with providers and and stakeholders really about particularly about destination capture because it tends to be plans destination um, and you know, there, there is a certain level of administration uh, required from all providers to then capture that or go back to learners. So if we're trying to really understand how we can improve that data collection without also increase, I suppose, adding um, a lot of administrative burden to providers when really we want to be focusing on the impact um, and equally working with Peter to understand what kind of data we can capture from central systems such as national insurance. Um, but there is a, a lag on that in terms of in terms of how quickly that can be captured. So. I suppose the, the true answer, Tim, is we're committed to improving it, but that's an area that, that is really quite tricky and that we continue to work work on to see how we can improve it. Um, the short answer is we will need to ask providers to capture more and submit more on the ILR. Okay. Thank you, but yeah, absolutely fully supportive of, the, yeah, of this proposal. Okay, thank you. So there's been a number of points made just general points that people think are important. So I think the first one from NAV was just a, just a call for continued partnership working when we're trying to bring about innovations and new initiatives, which I'm, sh I'm sure everybody would support, that we continue to work on the importance of uh, integrated uh, monitoring and data collection so we can monitor impact more closely. Um, a point about the importance of recognising that um, whilst we are assuring the quality of the of delivery in relation to the adult education budget there are challenges around how the mechanisms for support uh, help that to be delivered with more impact and that a clear recognition that the the um, lack of uh, an uplift in this funding has not been um, uh, pos at all positive in terms of managing to increase the number of people who can access the, uh, the this provision so with that, can I ask if people could just give a show of hands if they are uh, content to support the recommendation detailed at 2.36 on page 37 of the papers. Yep. So I think we've got unanimous support for that recommendation to be supported and put forward to the uh, Combined Authority. Thank you. 
So we're now moving on to um, an update on the current employment and skills programmes from the show. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And um, we will take on board the comment about making clear the link between the, the issues and the labour market and the, the solutions that we're trying to provide through, through programmes. Um, and I think, because um, Peter's presentation does provide really good context, actually, for the update that I'm about to give. And I, and I hope it's, um, I hope it's, I think the paper's quite complicated, isn't it? Because it goes through individual projects. Um, but overall, there are, there are key, two kind of key things that we're trying to do through all of these interventions. Um, one, of this is, one of these is to address labour shortages and, and skills, skills shortages um, by um, in responding to, to those both, both current, current issues and in the future um, by supporting employers to, to recruit the, the, the staff that they need. Um, in order that employers can be can be more resilient um, and and can take advantage of opportunities to them. So we're trying to create a talent pipeline that meets business needs. And that's one of the, the really important things we're trying to do. Um, but then also um, a lot of the activity that we're, we're delivering aims to increase the size of the labour pool by um, supporting more people into um, the workforce, particularly those um, individuals that are furthest um, from the labour market. And um, Peter did talk about um, the, the, the tight labour market um, and the, the fact that it is difficult to recruit because um, there are um, effectively more, more uh, vacancies than there are people looking for work. And that does provide a fairly unique opportunity to make a real difference in terms of the employment destinations of some of our most um, disadvantaged uh, residents of West Yorkshire. Um, so, so there's a sort of targeted activity that you can see in the paper, um, for example, targeting prison leavers, where there's a real appetite from, from employers to recruit people that in a different type of labour market they, they, they are less keen to do. So um, a lot of the activity that, that, you're, that is summarised in the paper aims to do those two things. So to address um, um, skill shortages in high demand areas through upskilling and retraining, but also to increase the size of the labour pool and to help support people to increase their earning potential, to access better work um, through, through support. So, so although there are a lot of different funding streams, um, those are really the, the key things that we're trying to do through, through all of the, the programmes. Um, so um, the, the figures at the beginning of the paper show that so far in this financial year, um, so as you know, we work with um, 181 secondary schools and colleges in West Yorkshire, and we, our team work with those um, institutions to improve their performance um, on, on the careers agenda and, to, and in the delivery of good quality careers education, and through that, to improve the careers destinations, particularly of our most disadvantaged young people in West Yorkshire. So um, we do fo focus... Um, disproportionately um, for that reason on the schools and colleges with the most diverse intake and those where we've got high representation of young people with special educational needs and disabilities um, who are really disadvantaged in the labour market. Um, we are really pleased that so far this year um, nearly 140 schools have, have made progress towards in, in their performance on these careers benchmarks. Um, which really shows the effectiveness of the, the joint working and the value that the team are, are providing in working, working with those, those schools. Um, however, it's, uh, we, the schools that still need to make progress are the special schools and those pupil referral units where it's really hard to improve um, career, careers and education. So we're working really, really closely with those schools um, to, to make a difference. Um, we're on target, well, ahead of target in terms of business engagement. Um, so we're really pleased that despite um, what colleagues were saying to Martin in particular was saying that uh, about some, some employers um, hesitating to invest in, in skills and training, we're certainly still seeing a huge amount of demand for engaging with education and training and employers still seeking out that impartial, impartial advice about which bit of the education and training system is right for them to engage with. So um, a real need for that impartial, um, impartial support, really, to navigate 
the system in order to meet business needs. Um, and with and um, you know you've just been hearing about the ed the adult education budget. Um, we've got a huge amount of support for for adults to to retrain, to upskill, to access employment and self-employment. Um, and we're really pleased that we're on, on target um, to, to support the number of people we, we set out to do um, so far this financial year. Um, since the <coughs> papers were published, um, we have received notification from the Department for Education um, that um, they, subject to contracting, they anticipate um, awarding us just under four million pounds to upskill um, around a thousand participants next year um, through through um, skills boot camps, which provide clear line of sight to a job, guaranteed interview, but also we're really keen to through that offer to support employers to to upskill and retrain staff and to and to recruit a talent pipeline as well. Um, and then finally, I wanted to draw your attention to the infographic slide in the appendix, which I think provides, I, I take no credit for it, um, um, but which I think provides a really good overview of, of the scale of, of what um, this committee is responsible for around um, the employment and skills agenda um, and, and the huge number of people that, you know, that, that through the work of this committee were able to support into into jobs and training and the outcomes that, that that together we're achieving so any questions or observations for michelle or any points on the paper anybody wants to raise Hi, yeah, just something that came up on levy transfer with West Yorkshire. So I sit on the Yorkshire and Humber Ambassador Network for Apprenticeships and one of the Flexi Job Apprenticeship Primes said um, that they tried to get levy transfer for West Yorkshire but the company had to be based in West Yorkshire um, and because they're a Flexi Job Apprenticeship Prime, they're not actually based in West Yorkshire even though the residents going on to the apprenticeship will be. So is there a way that you can look at that process? Because obviously 22 new selected job apprenticeship primes have just been announced and that might, one, increase your levy transfer and um, the spend um, at what's been pledged but also it will help local residents because they're employed by the prime, not by the employer, do you know, do you know what I mean? So um, I know that the, the one prime I spoke to said that other MCAs are doing it based on where the residents live, whereas but West Yorkshire is based on where the employer postcode is. So is there some way that you can look at flexing that to try and improve the, the levy transfer numbers in West Yorkshire. Yeah, we can certainly certainly look at that. But you're absolutely right. We're seeing this as a programme that supports SME apprenticeships. Um, so we can look at options um, around that. Tim. Michelle, excellent update. Thank you. Um, three, um, I've got uh, three, three questions from the report. If that's all right. On the, yeah. on the careers part, the future goals, yeah. yeah. Is, is there a way of tracking that through to see how that impacts onto uh, onto jobs? That's it. That's such a good question because I think with a a platform like that, the in, the reach is tells you only so much, doesn't it? And really, what we want to see is what impact that has on behaviour. The problem is, the more data capture you put in, the more of a barrier you create to people use, using it. So at the moment, we're, we're not capturing that much information about, pe about the characteristics of people because we really want people to use it. And as you can see, we've got some way to go to, to meet our targets around engagement with that platform. Mm -hmm. So the, the ambition is to, um, through future goals, is to ensure that people from West Yorkshire, of all ages, develop a better understanding of the amazing career opportunities that our region offers. Um, and we want people to use it. The concern is that the more you ask about people up front, they, they won't use it. So that's why it's fairly limited at the moment. But I absolutely agree that it would be really useful to know more about what people do as a result of getting engaging with that campaign. But it's always a bit of a balancing act. Okay, no, understood. It was, um, uh, yeah, just felt like a key, um, key metric out of it, really, to see, yeah, um, to see that output yeah, in terms of what it was having that impact. Uh, the, the, the second question on the um, on the skills connect 
Yeah, as I say, um, we've got 332 participants. Uh, you, you normally have a target. Is that is 332? Is that good? Is that on target? Head of target to where you want to be? So we've still got we've, we've got a lot of of, of activity um, still. Yeah, we've still, we've still got a long way to go um, in terms of, in terms of that program. Um, but we're running to um, 2025. So the focus so far has been on commissioning and contracting provision. Um, and we are pleased with the progress we're making there. Um, there, there we would really like to see um, that accelerate for some areas of the programme. So it's a programme that has um, different lots, including round support the graduates, a group who, as, as this committee will be aware, um, we have too many graduates underemployed um, in the region and therefore um, there is support through um, through this program to to upskill and to access jobs in some of our most high demand sectors, we'd really like to see um, the the we'd really like to see our higher education institutions um, delivering more on that um, on that program. Okay, understood. And f final one, just on the um, uh, on delivery agreements two three seven. What what do you see the benefit of those? So, the through 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 mayoral devolution, West Yorkshire and in particular this committee has control over far more of the skill system than it ever had. But the vast majority of education and skills funding remains nationally controlled. The intention with these strategic discussions um, with our seven. FE colleges is to be able to have a more well-rounded conversation that isn't just about the bit that formally is is uh, is in the control of the of the region, um, but so that um, as a region we're better able to understand the challenges, but the priorities and aspirations of those institutions as well, rather than just fo focusing on the bit that we are responsible okay. for. Yeah. That's the ambition there. Okay. So okay. building on the, the delivery agreements which were published pre-devolution, something that works in a, in a devolved context as kind of the next step from those. Tim, okay. do you feel that your question has been answered? Sounds like it. Okay, now. Uh, thanks, I just want to follow up really. Uh, as individual institutions, uh, FE colleges are pretty much free to do whatever they want. Um, within the limits of whatever contracts they're working towards. I think this is a way of trying to make sure that the colleges are fitting in with local regional thoughts about um, the way the colleges should be acting moving forward, as well as discussions with local authorities to do the same. So I suppose we want to be part of the overall system, um, rather than just going off and doing their own thing. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Nab. So I, I think in relation to this, this is about us being prog progressive and working as a system in a more in integrated way. And I think the other two questions were, re were really helpful and interesting because I think what you're calling for is, you know, let's, let's get, how do we get more engagement and uh, increase, you know, people's awareness and demand of wanting to come on our programmes and how do we continually strive to be able to monitor better impact and I'm sure that's something that the officers are continually thinking about, but it's good to be reminded about how we can get more integrated. I, I, get, I guess, I, I think it's a really interesting point, Michelle, that you said about um, people not wanting to divulge a lot of information about themselves initially, but then how do we make sure once they get trust and enjoy what they're doing, that mm. they feel comfortable to share information that will help us to understand the impact that it's had on them. Um, so I guess it's about developing trust as well. But um, good, good questions. Any, anybody got any other questions for Michelle? Councillor Turner. <coughs> yeah, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of points. Um, all the grass on here regionally, is it possible to break it down by, by area so that we can see how we're doing in relation to other people because those are just regional figures. Uh, and the same on, five, five, on the first item 5A, a lot of those were just regional figures. It's easier if we can, if we can break those down to the to actual local authority level because it gives us an idea of whether we're doing the right things. Because obviously there's a lot of LA programs as well going on which are not included in here. 
So it might be a wonder whether we, we can even capture those in future, the ones that's actually, you know, being done by the club that's, that's not in there. It might give us a bigger picture, a more rounded picture of what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and much of this, so particularly the employment support is, you're absolutely right, is delivered in that, that kind of hub and spoke model and looks different in different local authorities as it should, because the, the challenges and the infrastructure are, are different. So Councillor Turner, are you, you're saying you'd like to see more of that detail? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, more break, break it down by more by, by area. And as I say, there are some things in, in the first one, item five as well, which we perhaps could have broke down a little bit more. So it gives us an idea ourselves from a local forest manager if we're heading in the right direction against our comparison organisations. Okay, and Michelle's saying that that can be provided. Um, yeah, so certainly we can try and do that. And I guess I would also add that um, that we do provide. Um, that, so, for example, I'm due to attend Kirkley's College's um, Governor's Day this Friday. So we do provide um, much more bespoke data, both to some of our universities and to colleges um, at their request as well. When I say we, Peter really produces all of that. Um, you know, so there is, you're abs there is a wealth of, of data and we're really keen that people use it um, to make their decisions and to, and to plan. But we, we can certainly look at how we, how we provide that presented broken down more at the, this committee, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe um, uh, Milton. Councillor Turner, I'd, I'd like to see more breakdowns on this, the word ethnic minority engagement. Who, who are the ethnic minorities? Is it one, one specific minority group? Um, and that's right across the board, really, with all the reports. I generally don't know who they're engaging. Um, who are the providers? Um, if we look at the providers, um, you may have some interesting figures of the minority ethnic um, breakdown. So I'd like a little bit more about that. Who are the providers and and when you say ethnic minorities, who are they? In terms of ethnicity, yeah. disability, etc. That, that's right across the board to tell you the truth. Thank you. Okay, I can see Michelle's taking note of that. And Phil, did you want to comment then? Only, only really briefly. I mean, this is something we're looking at. Some of it depends on the kind of the commissioning and, and what information we're asking kind of providers for. But um, it's something we're working on, and, and particularly, um, the, for example, the Enterprise West Yorkshire program is a program where we have got good granularity, I believe, on that kind of data. So, um, and that's a newer program. So it's something we're looking at and trying to evolve. And it's a good, it's a good point. Thank you. And just, sorry, apologies, just to, just to add that when, if you look at the AB data pack, there's a lot of information in there um, about the breakdown, but I absolutely accept that it'd be good to, to get more consistency across, across programmes. Um, but we certainly um, break down in that, in that data pack that you've got with the papers, um, break down by ethnic minority group, because it's certainly not a, not a homogenous group by any means. So maybe is it fair to say that the data is there, there's, there's, there's some data there that would be very useful, maybe it's just about pointing it up, mm -hmm. okay. um, that would be, be helpful. Okay. And Michelle made a comment about the importance of uh, universities and doing everything we can to ensure that we've got uh, underemployment and graduate employment um, at the forefront of, uh, of our activities around student employability. I just wondered whether Peter or Tim wanted to comment on uh, that. Yeah, thanks very much for the comment. We'll certainly take that away and we'll make sure that partner institutions are aware of the opportunities that might be being missed. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And um, I, I sent, um, did, did I forward you a, a paper recently? Yeah which was about international students and employers not being particularly aware of the opportunities that international students um, offered. Um, sometimes they just didn't realise there was international students there available and didn't perhaps understand that it isn't as difficult as possible to sponsor international students when they've finished uh, their studies. Okay, I think, Michelle, we can move on then to the next item, which is quite a significant piece of work that's happening, um, the West Yorkshire Plan and Economic Strategy, two big pieces of work that are currently under development. I think Emma is going to uh, talk to this with Jennifer. 
Jennifer Robson and Emma Longbottom. Oh, it's Joe. Joe Barnum. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, Emma's had to give her apologies. Um, she got called into another meeting with some uh, government officials up today, so I'm going to cover the West Yorkshire plan. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words about the paper and the appendix um, that have been circulated on the West Yorkshire plan and then pass to Jen to talk through the economic strategy uh, element of it because the two things are closely aligned. So the, the paper sets out the purpose um, for West Yorkshire plan, which is intended to be a regional document to clearly articulate a shared vision, story and ambition for West Yorkshire. So we've previously had the SEP um, that had our ambitions for how we would spend the growth deal and we currently have our strategic economic framework which is a collection of all of our existing policies and strategies aligned around four priorities for the region but what the West Yorkshire plan will do is to set the trajectory for the long term up to 2040 so it reflects the changes that have happened um, in West Yorkshire most notably the devolution deal and the new powers and funding that we have so this means that when we engage with our stakeholders when we're talking to government we are setting out a shared ambition and a consistent message, so we're really strengthen strengthening um, those discussions that we have. So Appendix 1 that was in the, the meeting papers is a, a first draft. Um, just to reiterate that it is very much a draft and we do welcome feedback on it. Um, we're going through to committees at the moment, we've been to um, other groups, I think there's a few people here that um, sort of crossed over on other groups um, and engagement with the local authorities and business groups and universities. So I have had some feedback from members of this committee, which would be very welcome and we we'll look forward to, to taking more comments um, today as well. So the work so far has focused quite a lot on the sort of vision and the narrative element. Um, so what we've tried to do there is to move away a little bit from sort of having lots of lists of data and to bring out some of the more qualitative elements um, to tell that story about West Yorkshire. So as well as a vision and narrative, there are three priorities, enabling include equality, diversity and inclusion, um, tackling the climate emergency and growing an inclusive economy. So they will cut across all of our work um, that, that we and, and our partners uh, carry out. <clears throat> There's a series of um, aims aligned to our policy um, objectives and then a set of ambitious targets that we want to achieve. So the targets, um, there's still a little bit work to do on those to kind of um, finalise what that list will be, but they will align with the state of the region reporting. So we've got that consistency against uh, the indicators that are gathered there and, and what it is that we, we want to achieve set down in the West Yorkshire plan. So the West Yorkshire plan will act as an umbrella for all of our existing policies and strategies. Um, so those strategies that cover sort of our different policy areas, like we've got the transport strategy, the culture framework, the economic strategy that Jen's going to talk about, They'll, they provide a lot of the detail of how we're actually going to achieve um, the aims and ambitions that we set out in, in this document. And the West Yorkshire investment strategy will still be that document that sets out what our investment priority will be, but the next iteration of that will speak to the West Yorkshire plan as its overarching vision and um, objectives. So I'll, I'll pause there on, on the West Yorkshire plan element. Um, I'll pass over to Jen um, before taking any comments um, that, that people have on, on the draft. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So I'm Jen Robson, as just um, said. So I've been responsible for putting together the economic strategy to take us up to 2040. Um, and the reason that we thought we required an economic strategy is that previous economic strategy that had existed um, was created prior to the pandemic and Brexit, and it was based on the previous geography of the Leeds city region. Um, but with the um, incoming of a West York, Yorkshire mayor, um, and with the significant economic changes that have taken place over the past three years as a result of um, leaving the European Union and then the pandemic, we felt that what we really needed for the trajectory of the economy going forward was a clear vision. Um, and uh, what's been described as a lighthouse, so something that points the way for um, the economy and how we react um, to, to what the economic state is now, which is quite, is quite difficult, but also how we build resilience and look forward to the opportunities that we can seize in the future. So that's the real purpose of coming today with a proposed economic strategy. 
Um, what we would like to do in this strategy is make sure that it is aligned to um, the other pieces of work going on, which is why I've been working closely with Joe and Emma um, to make sure it sits um, alongside the West Yorkshire plan. Um, and we need it to recognise the, the realistic current economic environment and the implications that that has on the skills environment. Um, we also need to ensure that we're looking forwards and we um, are capturing on the opportunities available to us as a region from an economic perspective. So that's what the um, economic strategy aims to do. And to, in order to do that, we split it into two core sections. So one of them is a revised approach to sectors. And this is currently going through our multiple committees at the moment. Um, but the proposed approach to sectors, unlike traditional economic strategies that tend to look at the high growth R&D-led businesses only, this approach to strategy splits the economy into three sections. Um, so the names may vary slightly in the final iteration, but we have, in principle, the vital part of the economy at the, um, in one section, which is all our foundational sectors, the ones that really pulled through during the pandemic and we saw how vital they were to the economy. These tend to employ large numbers of people, but not necessarily at the highest um, pay grades of, of society, but without them, the economy would, wouldn't work. We then have our strategic parts of the economy. Now in West Yorkshire, this plays to some of our um, strategic sense, uh, strengths, both at a West Yorkshire level, but also a national level. So you could argue that a lot of our financial pro and professional services sit into this category. Um, and then we have our enabling, which is where traditionally um, support has been targeted um, economically. This is the high growth, scaling up R&D-led innovative businesses. Um, this approach to sectors will allow us to interact with the whole of the economy for the first or for the first time with it being laid out as such, um, allowing us to really align the mayor's pledges, um, allowing us to look at the social elements of the economy as well as just the high growth innovation led businesses. So it should allow it it's a mechanism for us to be able to really work with the whole of our businesses across the whole of our geography. Um, and is a real opportunity for us to look at where we intervene, but that of course needs to be aligned to our um, employment and skills framework, which is the reason I wanted to bring it to this committee today, to make sure that we understood when writing the economic strategy where the skills piece fits in, where, where does this have implications on the people of West Yorkshire, and where are the real opportunities that we can seize. So that's where I'd really welcome your insights and input. Um, just to give you a little bit of sense of where we've got to today, we've convened a task and finished group and there's members of around this table that are part of that group. Um, it also um, has a lot of our local authority partners um, and some of the feedback so far is that we need to create a greater sense of place within our um, economic strategy. So I've been working closely with Joe and team to make sure that we're pulling through some of that narrative from the West Yorkshire plan. Um, speaking to opportunities that we felt that we'd missed some of the opportunities in the skills and employment side so this again is my call to you really to ask for your support to help me to make sure that those opportunities really pull through the narrative um, we're also really keen to ensure that um, the economic strategy speaks to inclusive growth I spent the morning with um, Leeds City Council and their um, incl inclusive growth event um, so there's lots of opportunities across the region to pull some of these narratives through. Um, what we'd also like to make sure it is, is a really practical tool. Um, so within the economic strategy will be our delivery plan for the next two years. There's al already a vast number of programmes in delivery or about to go through delivery. But we also need to look at what do we do beyond the next two year period. So for that, the, what's emerged so far from the task and finish group and the various committees that we've been to is a series of driving forces. Now, these pick up on themes that will be very familiar and you've seen um, before in things like the WIS, 
but net zero and our commitment to net zero is of course in there. Technology enabled and that speaks to our digital strategy. Innovation driven, that speaks to our innovation strategy and the innovation festival that we had. Export enabled speaks to our trade strategy. Good work speaks to our fair work charter. And um, something that uh, many of our um, constituent um, local authorities were really keen that we use as a driving force going forward was creating a resilient and flexible businesses. So making the conditions for lots of different models of businesses to be supported and ensuring that we looked at social value in different ways that businesses contribute to the economy as a whole. So we've also drafted um, a driving force uh, line around resilient businesses and resilient business models, um, which again, I think needs some consideration from an employment and people's perspective. Um, so I guess my key questions today um, to, to consider, and I'd appreciate any feedback by email or by taking part in the task and finish group, um, is what opportunities do you see um, coming forward from an employment and skills perspective? Um, what are the major challenges from an employment and skills perspective? And what key skills do we need to be considering when creating the economic strategy to take us forwards? Um, over the next few weeks, we'll continue to meet with our committee groups um, with a view that we'll have a revised draft by March. Um, and then we're just debating internally at the moment whether how quickly then we go on to full publication uh, of the final version. Um, but there's certainly a viewpoint to get this right rather than to necessarily be led by speed. So that, that balance is in the discussion at the moment, but we'd appreciate any feedback um, at your earliest convenience so that we can get it right as soon as possible. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you, um, Jennifer and Joe, for that. I mean, these are two really important pieces of strategic work that are going on right, right across our region. Um, I think you're right. You want, you want to get them connected and you want to be collaborative in, in, in designing these. I'm sure a lot of people will already have been involved in some shape or form in this, but maybe, Michelle, do you want to say a few things about how the contribution from this committee and yourself will be managed? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I can think that briefly. Phil's I, I, I think I think um, that the economic strategy is primarily the primary um, committee that's kind of driving it is the business um, economy and innovation committee um, because it's mainly around kind of our sectors and our support and we've already got um, an eco um, an employment and skills framework which which this this committee has helped shape, but um, nothing is an island so there's a connection between. Clearly, the sectors that are important to our regional economy, which is which as Jen has outlined, is not just the kind of the shiny sectors like um, life, um, like um, health tech or or um, digital, um, but it but it's a whole wide range of sectors that are important both for kind of job growth and also enabling growth, such as construction, for example. Um, you can't have much business growth without um, people around to build things. So um, we want to we want to engage with this this committee on this this strategy, and many of you I know are already involved and engaged with this. I think I've spoken to Martin about this several, several times, for example, in different meetings of different guises, um, with his um, business rep hat on. So so we're interested in feedback, and in terms of as as Jen said, the trajectory for this, there's lots of opportunities to comment. Um, I believe we're taking a kind of a draft version with stuff on paper to go to the lep board in March and that meeting is the beginning of March as we kind of shape it for final publication in the summer. So so um, lots of chan chance to input um, but just wanted this committee to be aware of it and brought here because of the links to kind of employment and skills activity. Okay thanks Phil. Um, i just jump in quickly yeah, just on a niggle. Um, in the set in the context you talk about your wonderful seven HE institutions and your excellent colleges You've also got a lot of excellent local independent training providers as well, so we can just make sure that that's in included also. Okay, thanks, yeah. Alex. Did it can reflect that? Then. Peter, yeah. I think Peter was first, and then now. Yeah, um, you mentioned about a task and finish group. Can I ask who from the universities is on that? 
Um, also, we had a dinner with the mayor in December where we said we would um, offer and facilitate a conversation with the universities collectively around the strategy and the plan. So that offer is still there, but mindful your timetable seems to be moving pretty quick. Yeah, P P Peter, as, as elect member, I'm, I've joined that task and finish group. At the last meet, I think it was last week, was it? Um, week, week, week before. And I think they're very keen, the group, um, Jen in particular, to get feedback from YPERN. And have you had that back yet? I know you were waiting for it. It's, it's probably two things. Probably that's the academic research side, but there's also the conversation with the universities, institutionally and collectively, yeah. which one you can facilitate. So you'll get you know, uh, senior kind of officers or leadership within the universities who can be a part of that. So yeah. I think just to make sure it's clear that YPERN is on the research sort of side and the academic side, but I think it's the discussion with the universities, surely, yeah, collectively, okay. I think, so, so maybe, it's maybe probably we, a separate thing. Maybe we could take a point, Jen, to convene a separate group, maybe with interested people from... Peter, maybe you could coordinate that. Yeah, and just to say, Peter, we're meeting with Monica as well to um, bring forward a, a, an office group as well for some of the VC dinner action. So we've got that on, on the radar as well. Okay, Nav. Yeah, thanks. I mean, because it's interesting you saw the word colleges, but I couldn't see it. Um, so, uh, and, and I think it goes back to how we make us all part of this document that's brewing, isn't it? Now, if, if I was reading this from the point of view of the NHS, I can see a commitment in there about having a healthy lifestyle, but I wouldn't see what is one of the major employers in the region and um, producers of productivity not being missed. And so maybe there's a need just for a few more conversations outside the combined authority as you develop, just those people can feel part of it. And you know, even if it is just putting in further education training providers in there, it makes everybody feel happier and warmer and, and more likely to support it. So if you are... Yeah, in the style that you have in that meeting with the universities, it could easily make one happen with further education, Colin. In fact, you could come to the next skills partnership and then you'll hit us all in one go. That makes sense. Because everyone wants to get a mention, I suppose. Milton? Yeah, following on for that as well, I'd, I'd like to see more of um, social enterprise, voluntary sectors, um, sole traders in, included in that. Big, big contribution to the economy. And if you're having um, a, a day where you want to audit that and, and meet people, I'm happy to um, work with you on that one too, trying to get those grassroots organizations in and share their experiences with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll take um, Tim's question and I can't see if Sharon is it. Thanks, Shirley. Um, yeah, I think this is a very important document. Uh, it's a good exercise to develop that narrative, which helps us to understand fundamentally what we're trying to achieve. Uh, I do think, though, there's a danger that we become the audience of the document. Uh, and I think there is a question to be asked quite hard around who is the intended audience for the document. And this isn't intended to belittle anybody's contribution as it might be written into the document, but we need to think about how we talk about people given those intended audiences. Because there is a danger that we just mention everybody, because obviously everybody's important, but people matter in different ways to different audiences. I suppose another way to think about the document is to think, so how will the other mayoral combined authorities be describing themselves? Because there's a strong chance that whichever audience we pick that audience will also be being offered similar documents from the other mayoral combined authorities. And we need to think, how do we compare to them? And in particular, where do the particular points of opportunity and leverage in West Yorkshire, where do they occur? Very crudely, when I'm producing this kind of document in other settings, I always think first, best, and only. And if you can fit into any of those categories, then you're worth an inclusion. If you're not, it doesn't mean that you're not important, 
But if you're trying to get traction with that audience, then you need to make sure that they understand that there's something distinctive about what it is that that particular uh, body is doing. And now, you will understand that that inevitably leads to me making a point about the universities in West Yorkshire. There are many distinctive things about them, which I think we could bring out more clearly in the document. They are, for example, distinctive in acting as a skills magnet in a way that doesn't apply in many other regions, which are net exporters of graduates. There are also particular strands of work in West Yorkshire which are distinctive. I've mentioned before in this setting business schools. We are very fortunate to have a particular concentration of high-ranked business schools in terms of the objective world rankings of business schools in this small area. It's that kind of thing which I think would give us clear traction with many audiences, although I am humble enough to recognize that you know that's for other people to decide, and it might be that other things on the first best only list uh, play better with them. Thanks, Tim. So maybe, Jen, there's a few. Oh, Sharon, do you want to go first? Yeah, could I just um, add again about the task and finish group um, and just what representation there might have been for economically inactive or unemployed um, residents as part of your you know, your strategy, as you commit your, your ambitions and the employment rate, the skills levels, um, the productivity will all need that factoring from a West Yorkshire perspective and has the uh, West Yorkshire as an area has a higher rate of economically inactive, <coughs> excuse me, um, the national, then I think that should be in there as well. Jen, could you put your microphone on? Sorry, thanks. Um, I think that is an area where we could do with some support to really understand who to speak to to represent that group. Because we've had those voices and concerns brought to us in different ways through different parts of the task and finish group, but nobody's specifically responsible for that group as a whole. So if you have some suggestions, are you willing to participate? That would be most welcome. Yeah, I'm definitely willing to participate. It is a challenge because it's such a diverse group, and as I'm sure my colleague was producing the data earlier, um, there are a, a variety of people who fit into that group. But I think there is definitely some potential, building on what we've been doing with skills already, um, to bring in some of those um, economically inactive and get them back into the labour market, definitely. So happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, Martin, you wanted? Yeah, um, thank you. I think it's, uh, it, it's going to be a very difficult task to, to merge all of these different strategies together because, uh, I mean, this is the first time we've talked about inclusive growth when we're talking about skills, so when we're trying to determine the type of jobs we want in the future. <laughs> We've talked about what businesses want, or they might not be the kind of jobs that this, this plan comes up with. Uh, and I'm also a bit concerned, we've also got, um, you know, in my area I work with three uh, local authorities, closely all of whom are writing their own economic strategies. Some of them will not fit with this economic strategy, and so it's how we merge um, all of those things together. And just a final point, it's having a strategy is fine, but only if you've got some tools to help us deliver it. And the biggest tool, well, one of the biggest tools that we've got in terms of support to business is the UK Share Prosperity Fund and that, that, that's for the next three years and that's already been done without consultation with all of the partners that actually work with businesses and, and, and others in the area. Okay, so I'm conscious of the time. This is clearly of interest to everybody because everybody's wanting to, to, to offer thoughts and ideas in relation to both of these plans. So I think what we've heard is um, opportunities to discuss things with the FE colleges, with the university, with, the, um, with Sharon and her point about um, the economically disadvantaged, the Milton's uh, made. Yeah. Okay, so, so I think well, you could, if you could follow up on those within the time scale you've got, I think the other thing that people are saying is it's really important it's about West Yorkshire, but it's also how all of the parts of West Yorkshire fit in. And Tim um, calling for um, us to you to really think about the audience and who we're speaking to. And I, I quite like the first, better only. It reminds me of Fiona Bruce on the Antique Roadshow. <laughs> I can't remember what it is, but it's better, best, worse or something. can't remember. But um, so thank you for that. And um, everybody will wait to, to hear from you.
Thank you. So let's move on uh, in terms of time to our next item, which is uh, the employment and skills development and future delivery. This is a presentation from Sonia Midgley. Is that so, Sonia? So, Michelle is going to present that. Yeah, so, so Sonia's going, Sonia's had to step away. She just wanted to ask me to cover, she asked me to cover one thing before I hand over to Michelle. So since the publication of the paper, um, we've, we're really pleased that we've been started working closely with um, colleagues from the Department for Work and Pensions to look at opportunities for strategic alignment on the employment support agenda, including through existing programme delivery, but also by identifying future areas of collaboration. So to identify how this could work and to develop a shared action plan, DWP have dedicated a member of staff um, to be placed to work with the command authority over the next few months. Obviously an area of keen interest for this committee, so we'll be really keen to, um, to keep you updated going forward. And then over to Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so the committee members, you received a detailed update of the, um, the Green Jobs Task Force, so this is just intended to give a high-level summary of that um, today and then just have a short discussion on the recommendations. Um, so just by way of overview of the, of the Green Jobs Task Force, um, it's chaired by the Mayor. The objective of that is to create deliverable actions in the form of recommendations that help us to create 1,000 well-paid green jobs for young people. So the task force is made up of diverse membership of around 30 people. Young people have also been um, have played a role in that task force as well in shaping the recommendations. It was always intended to be a short-term intervention. There's been three meetings so far. The fourth and final meeting will take place on the 6th of February. Um, following that, this committee will be asked to endorse and adopt a set, uh, adopt, rather, a set of recommendations and actions. Um, so just in terms of the def definition of green jobs, which has provided steer for the development of the recommendations, um, we've used the national, the national um, definition, which is currently under review, um, and this has been in line with the, task force, the national task force um, and the government's definition of green jobs and has helped to create that steer on, on the recommendations so far. In terms of um, the progress to date, the task force has commissioned two pieces of research to help shape the recommendations um, and, and ensure that they're research led. One of those uh, pieces of research has been to work with um, stakeholders, including employers, to define a clear picture of West Yorkshire's current and future green economy. And that was um, done through WPI Economics. The second piece of research was um, to, uh, to speak to young people. Um, we commissioned a head partnership to, to undertake an activity over summer last year to understand um, how young people perceived green jobs and their ambitions and ideas around those. There's also been several task and finish groups with various stakeholders to seek feedback on the emerging recommendations. Um, plus a series of specific recommendations workshops to discuss the, the up and coming themes and outcomes of the research. Um, so in terms of those research findings, um, you've received a, a, a slide pack in, in the uh, papers which outlines the, the findings in detail. But WPI Economics um, did, uh, led a mission based approach to defining the green economy, reflecting um, the approach taken by the National Green Jobs Task Force and it focused on solutions that would support the achievement to net zero. The research shown, showed that um, the number of green jobs has increased in our region, um, and it's estimated that this will increase further towards 2030. And the, there are large numbers of growing green policy areas, including climate adaptation, professional research services, and homes and buildings. Um, we know that there are around 9.2% of West Yorkshire's employment um, is, is in, in terms of carbon intensive sectors. Um, WPI were also asked to focus on EDI and found that 13% of, of those in employment uh, were from uh, in sectors which were exposed to high carbon and transition were from non-white backgrounds versus 11% nationally. Um, so in terms of the research findings from the youth programme. Um, Head Partnership engaged 174 young people over summer and um, they engaged young people from ages 4 to 17, so a really wide range um, age group. The, their findings concluded that young people's understanding of green jobs massively varied. Um, 
the, the perceptions of the green jobs were, were based around environmental, low skilled. Um, lots of young people said they wouldn't consider a career within the green sector. That increased significantly at the end of the program. Um, we also found out that young people absorb careers informa information in many different ways, it's, which has been really helpful in how we shape the recommendations in terms of changing behaviour of young people. And we, we, we understand from the research that there are many, many barriers to, to young people accessing this, um, this information and making decisions about their future. Um, so in terms of putting that policy um, and research into development, there are three key themes. So the, the, the recommendations are formed in a thematic approach under ed individuals, educators and business. So we know that um, in order to move forward on some of the ambitions around green skills, behaviour change is a, is a key uh, factor and how we upskill, reskill and retrain our workforce to be able to transition to net zero is, is critical. We know that educators and the focus on FE and independent training providers and colleges um, is, is also crucial to ensure that the provision is up to date and is responsive to the demands of employers and businesses um, to enable them to skill their workforce um, create skills for decarbonisation, mitigate risk from transitioning um, but also to create and retain talent um, and we know that there are some sectors that will warrant specific uh, support such as retrofit and manufacturing. And then just moving on to the recommendations. So the ambition with the seven recommendations which are on screen and I think they're also in the papers, um, these will provide steer for future interventions and also current interventions and help um, and support the way that we deliver programmes in the region. So there are seven uh, recommendations in total um, they also link to our employment skills framework and the ambitions outlined in our climate and environment action plan. So the recommendations are around how we work with young people to help them feel inspired about careers and pathways and opportunities within the green economy, particularly starting at, at a primary school age um, and not just uh, secondary but all the way through to HE. Um, how we facilitate uh, people to access information around careers and pathways, that's young people and adults so that they can make decisions about the green sector. Um, how we embed and engage the target groups, that's young people and adults, in the design of programmes that help to um, shape the green economy and upskill and, um, and reskill individuals. And how we support um, education providers to build curriculums that respond to the green economy and help them build capacity to retain talent and attract talent into the sector and how we enable businesses to um, support and decarbonise and attract and develop and retain talent. And then how we position ourselves as West Yorkshire by strengthening our specialisms to stimulate demand, um, particularly within those key sectors. And then every uh, piece of research that we've, we've done and, and all the task and finish groups have been very, um, very, very supportive of an EDI recommendation and felt that EDI should have its own recommendation, um, but also should be woven in throughout the other six recommendations as well. So we've put in um, a proposed recommendation there around how we, how we address some of the concerns around EDI, particularly around those attracting women to the sector and increasing diversity within the sector. So within the papers, we, um, we asked the committee to share any views on those recommendations um, so I'll, I'll pause for a minute if, if anybody would like to share any views around um, the, the two key questions that we asked the committee, which were around, um, are, the, are the recommendations reflective of West Yorkshire's commitment to jobs and skills? And are there any gaps that the committee would like to share that they feel are missing from those seven recommendations? Brilliant. Thanks, Michelle. Very, very interesting feedback from the young people. Uh, so, any comments, reflections? I'd be interested to find out what he asked the four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the response even. Yeah. I can tell you what they said. They, they felt that um, green jobs were litter pickers, is one of the things that they said. It's not only what they said, but their perceptions of green jobs were very uh, small, shall we say. Yeah. 
Brilliant. Any uh, any other comments? People have what people are feeling about the recommendations. Then we've been asked specifically to um, offer some comments. Do are we largely supportive? Is there anything we want to uh, add, enhance, Martin? Yeah, I'm, I'm asked this question all the time, and I never know how to answer it on what a green job is. Um, and I, I know it's not as straightforward, but it's the, there's lots of things which which may look green, which aren't. And, and we know I know we don't know what most of them will be in ten years' time. But is there a, a list? Is there there's something that we can look at that could help us define this? So when we're talking about it, I could answer that question in the pub. <laughs> Thank you. I will. Um, the, the definition that we have used for the, uh, for this, uh, for the uh, task force is the one that, that is up on the screen. It's the national definition of green jobs. Um, I will just defer to Peter to see if he has a, a more detailed and data-driven response on this. <laughs> so I think, I think in, your, in your original question, Martin, you sort of... You sort of answered it really because there isn't a straightforward um, answer to this so within the study the definition that was used was a kind of mission-based study so it was looking at activities that contribute to uh, the achievement of net zero and also wider sort of environmental aims so the, the the key sectors within that i think michelle alluded to those i think range from sort of um uh, sort of the building sector including things like retrofit but also um, activities like uh, finance and professional services, because that has a crucial role in securing investment uh, to support uh, green, you know, the development of the green economy and the full range of um, activities that are needed to achieve net zero. So, using that kind of definition within those sec within those sectors, there are a range of jobs, some of which are not ordinarily regarded as green. That are needed to sort of feed further uh, green objectives, so that might include administrative jobs. Um, another way of looking at it, though, is looking at job content and saying, do, do you know, the specific skills and the tasks that are undertaken within a job, uh, how do they contribute to uh, the sort of the, the green agenda? And that's so might have occupations like civil, civil engineering, uh, and you know, around groundworks, but also even more specifically, roles like. Um, environmental scientist, um, sort of sustainability officer within a company. So you can isolate those companies where there is a very explicit contribution. But um, I think a wide range of jobs, including things like administrative jobs, uh, sales jobs, will need to have a kind of green orientation if we're, if we're to achieve net zero. So it's a very long-winded answer, but uh, there isn't a simple list, I don't think other than those really sort of jobs which have a high intensity of what you might call green skills around, say, energy um, and, and, and directly around the environment. I, uh, the reason I was asking this too is um, lots of smaller, um, small and medium businesses um, would love to be greener and they don't know how. Um, they need to... They, 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 that they need something simple, little things that they can do rather than a big cultural change and then more people will be engaged with it. And also I'm a bit um, worried when I, th th there's lots of talk saying that we need lots of electric um, car mechanics and we need lots of uh, heat source pump, pump fitters and we don't, you know, the, the sector will, will, will sort itself out, the private sector will fill those gaps as and when there are, there's a requirement for those things. Um, there's currently not the requirement. Um, electric cars famously don't need servicing uh, very often. It's just that there's lots that we keep reading about in newspapers which aren't green jobs, or if there are, there's, there's no real need um, for them currently. Okay, thank you for that, Martin. So I'll, I'll just take one final point because then I think we will ask any, everybody if you've got just any other response comments. Just to Martin quickly, there is yeah. some research that came out in Wakefield, Wakefield College and Wakefield Council completed some, and it had a whole list of jobs that are have, have used that definition, but also uh, looked at Wakefield. It's really interesting piece of 
work that might help some of those, and it's got some solutions and recommendations in there as well. Maybe Alex, you could share that with, uh, with Jeanette and she could circulate it after the meeting. So any other comments, please do pass them to, to, to Michelle so she can feed into the, the further work on this and share it with colleagues and you know, discuss it and feedback be very, very helpful for her. So thank you for that. So I think we are now at the point of the meeting where um, the public part of the meeting is complete. So I will have to ask our colleagues from the press and any members of the public to leave at this point.